emphasis made this morning on it is no longer I that live, but Christ that liveth in me, and the life that I now allow live in the flesh. I live by faith, the faith that's in the Son of God, who loved me, gave himself up for me. That passage, Galatians 2.20, is about the Holy Spirit, just doesn't use the word. So on this page, the first one, I think that was passed out anyway, the one that's evidence of the personal and practical significance of the Holy Spirit, that outline uses under each category, each main section there, a list of compare passages. Compare these passages that do not mention the Holy Spirit, but they're teaching about this important teaching that we really need to understand, to understand the ministry of the administration of the Holy Spirit. See over that now. <clears throat> Brother Ennis Dowling, a fine scholar among us for many years, was a boy in Indiana when he was in high school, at this time of the summer, it was very hot. It was the fair season, and on the farm they had good hogs. They took the hogs to the fair, and Ennis had the job one afternoon of scrubbing the hog and polishing its toenails and curling its tail and everything to make it a show hog. And he got it done. He was chasing the hog to the show ring where it would be judged with the others, and that hog found a mud puddle and got down and wallowed in it. I heard Dennis tell us that he needed this himself in a sermon on Ephesians 1 2. He said he was able to chase the hog back to his stall and get the hose and the brush and get him all cleaned up again. At that time, carefully steer him away from that mud puddle, get him to the show ring. But it was a hot day, it was hot work, and Ennis was hot under the collar in the inside. <clears throat> but his hog got the first prize, he got the blue ribbon. He went home that afternoon, got out of the car, at the back door of the farmhouse with the blue ribbon in his hand and he saw a sight that gave him a flash of inspiration. He saw the, the farm cat sitting there washing himself. And he said, if I just take the spirit of the cat and put it in the pig, I'd have it made. <laughs> now you can all picture that, can't you? Did you ever make anything? Did it turn out right? Did you ever make something that just didn't turn out right and you had to go back, as they say now, back to the drawing board, so you have to go back and make it all over again? God made a wonderful being in his own likeness to be in charge of a great creation. And then that being man disobeyed him and brought this barrier and estrangement between God and man. God said, I have to make him all over again. Yes. Now the first creation was pretty easy. The mud was pliable and God could make man out of the dust of the earth. And God had the strong breath. He could breathe the breath of life into that man and he could make him. But the second creation, to take the man already exercising his will against God's will, already corrupted and polluted by sin, and settle both the punishment of his sin and the change of his nature and the production of a true child of God still without taking any choice away from him, Amen. this is a big deal. Amen. In a moment's time or a few minutes' time, God could speak the whole illimitable universe into being. And he did. I don't think there was death until there was sin, or there was sin until there was man. However God made it, I think that even though I used to try to study scientific biology and scientific geology and so forth, and, and evolution is the biggest, damnedest lie that ever got on this face of this earth. Because it denies what God says he did not do, uh, what God said he did do, and uh, it teaches people to think of our being as some kind of an accident or something we ourselves accomplished or anything except what God did. And keeping God out of the minds of men is the devil's chief purpose. Yeah. And uh, evolution and communism are, are rivals for the devil's greatest inventions. <laughs> to dehumanize man and to separate him from God. But we'll not go into that. God needed to make us over. Remember that? <clears throat> but to make us over, it took him a long time to reach the heart of man with the conviction of sin. The wage of sin is death. The rightness of judgment and punishment. And to begin to teach us to trust God and look to God for the source of life. And teach the principle that life is the price of life. The principle of sacrifice and then to send his son into the world and transform, renew, reinvent again. Uh, 
God really reinvented mankind. Ford never really invented the, the car. They just say it every year. They reinvented something when they want to tell you a new model. But God really made new creatures. If any man is in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. I might be all right to say creature, but actually the Greek word is a noun of action and not the uh, accomplished product. We are a new creation, somewhat in process. <clears throat> so God predicted giving of his spirit way back in the days of Ezekiel. Did you ever hear this from Ezekiel 36, verse 26? A new heart will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart, I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, that ye should keep mine ordinances and do them. Now, he wasn't doing it right away or in that day. And what we've been talking about in Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, the nature of the new covenant is the law of God in the heart Amen. and in the mind. And where we would really know God as our God and we would be his people. And where we would really have our sins done away. That's a new creation. I want all of you, children and all of you, to be able to picture this. There are four sides to salvation. <clears throat> There's the forgiveness of sin. That's basic. Don't dodge that. That's the first uh, interest place. Forgiveness of sins in Christ. But there is the cure of sin in our heart. The reconciliation is not only canceling the case that God has against us, removing the charge of guilt, but changing the grudge that we have in our hearts against God having the mastery of our lives. We need to change from our distrust to trust and from our dodging God to seeking God and seeking his will and loving God and loving his will. And there's a great change to be made in man to make him what God made him to be in the first place. Then there is the gift of eternal life. We brought death into the world and death was a a wise part of God's plan, yes. and death is yours, 1 Corinthians 3 says. Yes. Death is yours, thank God for it. First death in our family in 14 years occurred this month, and I went to Iowa to help bury my oldest sister. Now, last time there was a death in our family, I was in the Philippines in 1982, and my mother, 96 and a half years old, died. and. Uh, and most of the family got together in Iowa, and I didn't get back from the Philippines in time to get there, but it must have been quite an experience in gathering. More of the family got together then, I guess, than for a long time. <clears throat> Death is not something to be feared and dreaded. God invented it for our benefit, but we need to acknowledge the privilege of accepting the death of Jesus Christ. I'm crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, yet I live. Yet it's not I, but Christ liveth in me. Amen. And the life that I now live, I live by faith. Amen. The whole life is a matter of faith in Christ, in cooperation with Christ. And that Amen. welcomes Christ into our lives. With the very first announcements of the new reign of Christ, the kingdom of God, came the promises of the Holy Spirit, Matthew 3, 11. Amen. I baptize you in water for the remission of sins is said also, not in that verse, but Mark 1, 4, and other passages make very plain, John the Baptist's baptism was for the remission of sins. Amen. But just forgiveness of sins was not enough. Amen. He who comes after me who is greater than I, he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. Now, Matthew said, the Holy Spirit and fire. When Mark quoted that, he didn't add the and fire. When Luke quoted 3.16, he did add the and fire. And then in John 1, what about the 25th verse, John was saying, um, I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize in water told me on whomsoever you see the Spirit descending and abiding on him. Remember that dove that came down, Luke 3 tells about descending in the bodily form of a dove and a boat upon him. That dove never left. What happened to it? It just absorbed into him or something. 
Not that it made any particular difference in Jesus, but this is the witness to John. Amen. On whomsoever you see this happening, this is he who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. I think those predictions, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all four, are mainly to identify the baptizer, not those who are being baptized. Amen. Some people try to figure out how you will, he will baptize you, who are the you in the Holy Spirit, and in fire. And some people take it that on the day of Pentecost, tongues parted asunder like as a fire are a baptism of fire. No, there wasn't any baptism by fire. There wasn't even any fire. If I tell you I saw an animal like a horse, you know I knew it wasn't a horse. These were tongues, diamerizomai, being divided apart like as a fire. Whether they had other fiery appearance, I don't know. But that's the one particular way in which they're identified with appearance of fire. And so, what was John preaching about? You, you read the context, especially in Luke 3. Every tree that brings forth not good fruit should be cut down and cast into the fire. His threshing floor is being cleansed. He will gather the wheat into the garner, the, the uh, what do you call it, the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Interestingly enough, in Greek he used the word asbestos, asbestos fire. <laughs> we borrowed the Greek word asbestos from classical Greek and use it for the opposite, instead of unquenchable being un unignitable. But uh, <clears throat> some of the insurance companies in this country like to forget about asbestos. You don't understand about that? <laughs> People are suing them now for great sums of money on claimed lung disease as a result of asbestos. I've worked with asbestos a little bit in making an electric furnace and then a laboratory one time and so forth. Didn't mind licking it with my tongue and things like that. I've never, uh, but the people who worked where it was breathed in the air very much, got something like uh, miners get of, of uh, disease of the lung from mineral matter destroying cells or causing them to be scar tissue and so forth. But uh, the Environmental Protection Agency, with a lot of political purposes, magnifies these things until it gets to be a tremendous thing. Um, the time will come you may wish you were asbestos. <laughs> God has a fire and John was preaching about it. Amen. And Jesus preached about it. Matthew 25, 31 to 46. All of you who are not doing what represents my spirit in you are going to be cast into the lake of fire that prepared for the devil and his angels. That's a baptism in fire. I don't want any of it. Amen. Revelation 20. The devil and... The false prophet and a lot of other things are cast into the lake of fire. And that's a baptism in fire. And the only fire John ever preached about was the fire of a firing condemnation and destruction. Amen. Baptism of the Holy Spirit is to save you from that. And Amen. Jesus didn't say anything more about what was baptism in the Holy Spirit. He just said, everyone who believes in me from within him shall flow rivers of living water. He'll be a fire hydrant. Who wants to be a fire hydrant? Well, if you're a believer in Jesus, you're going to be. Amen. And that is, out of the life of the believer flows the refreshing waters, Amen. not only in Cherryville and Joplin. Amen. <clears throat> of the Spirit of Christ. You know, that was in John 7, 38. It was at the Feast of Tabernacles. It was the last great day of the feast, the day of the pouring out of waters from the golden pitcher and... Uh, Jesus said to the crowd in a loud voice, Come to me, all ye that thirst. Uh, and he said, Everyone who believes in me, out of him will flow the streams of living water. Amen. And he didn't explain. Sixty years later, approximately, John wrote up in the area of Ephesus, a thousand miles away, approximately, that this he spoke of the Holy Spirit, which those who believe in were to receive afterward, for the Spirit was not yet given, because Christ was not yet glorified. People who talk about the Holy Spirit very seldom pay attention to that verse. Yes. Amen. So we're talking about what Jesus taught about the Holy Spirit. One thing in between John's Matthew 3 passage and John, I mean Matthew's, I mean John the Baptist passage in Matthew 3, and the John 7 passage six months before Jesus' death, one time Jesus was teaching about prayer. You being evil know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? 
And that's a surprising thing in there. In the parallel passage, similar teaching, he said, give good gifts to them that ask him. But he actually has a great supreme gift, the gift of his Holy Spirit, to give to them that really seek it of God with faith. And I hope that you will get more and more interested we are to talk today about the ministration of that Spirit. In uh, the first teaching of Jesus in Jerusalem, the very beginning of his public ministry, which most people overlook because Matthew, Mark, and Luke never mention it. They act as if Jesus began his public ministry, sound as if he began in Galilee, and uh, that was about nine or ten months after he went to, or eight or nine months anyway, he went to Jerusalem for the Passover, and Nicodemus, a Pharisee, ruler of the Jews, came to Jesus that night and said, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher sent from God. For no one can do these things you're doing except God be with him. I wish there were a lot more people smart as Nicodemus. Amen. And Jesus answered him. Strangely enough, it, maybe he said something he didn't quote it. But his quoted answer was, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except you be born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Or except he be, no man can see. Any man cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said, How can a man be born when he's old? And Jesus said, except you be born of water and the Spirit, you can in no wise enter into the kingdom of God. John 3, 5. And preachers have been dodging that passage ever since. What is the birth of the water and the Spirit? Well, Nicodemus still questioned how could these things be. And Jesus said, the wind blows. And you don't know where it comes from. You don't know where it's going. But you, see, you hear the sound thereof. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. And he said, Nicodemus, are you a teacher of Israel and you don't understand these things? What if I told you heavenly things? <laughs> but we won't tarry with that one either. <clears throat> Why is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit so fatal? Jesus said, blasphemies against God, against the Son will be forgiven, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, neither in this life nor in the life to come. And this is shocking. So people wonder, what's the unpardonable sin? He never explained it. But you just watch. If you misunderstood Jesus, like Saul of Tarsus did and a lot of other people, you could later, after the resurrection or after a further revelation, come to believe in Jesus. But if you reject the revelation of the Holy Spirit after the ministry of Jesus, you've missed the last boat. There is no cure for the one who rejects the gospel of the message of the Holy Spirit. I think that's more likely to explain it than anything else. Why was the baptism of John, John the Baptist, not equal to the baptism into Christ practiced by the apostles? You see it in, in uh, Acts 19, the 12 minute Ephesus. Now take that sheet, Evidence of the Personal and Practical Significance of the Holy Spirit, and let's just look at some of these passages you're going to study and learn about. The New Testament shows the Holy Spirit is a gift from God to be valued and enjoyed, promised to everyone obeying the gospel. And Jesus thought a supreme gift to be sought by prayer, or that shows the extraordinary goodness of God. It is for every true believer in Jesus, John 7, 38 and 39. There are your passages we were looking at. He dwells in our bodies. Now this, strangely enough, some of the well-known scholars of the non-instrument churches of Christ, a cappella brethren, have tried to prove the Holy Spirit was not a person and that the New Testament didn't teach an indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Chester Williamson wrote a good long, uh, you remember that, Wally? The, the good long answer to what? Foy e Oh, well, the name gets away from me. Some of you know of him. Look, know you not that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, who, which you have from God, and you're not your own. You're bought with a well, That's not the part we want to hear, was it? You're not your own. You're bought with a price. Glorify God, therefore, in your bodies. Amen. First Thessalonians 4, 8. If you don't accept the commandment of God, the teaching God about sexual holiness and purity, you're rejecting 
Not man, but God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. It's not a gift from the Holy Spirit, promised Acts 2.38. It's the Holy Spirit is the gift. The gift which is the Holy Spirit. And that's perfectly clear from these passages. I'd look at the next. As Michael said in this introduction, the Holy Spirit is a necessity in order to be in Christ and be saved. We must be born of the Spirit as well as of the water. He is part of the means of salvation. Titus 3, I really like this passage in some ways. It's just so very clear. And I'd like to read it with you from the beginning of Titus 3. That's from the third chapter. You put them in mind to be in subjection to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready unto every good work, to speak evil of no man, not to be contentious, to be gentle, showing all meekness toward all men, for we were once all foolish. All have been partakers of that human nature. Disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Terrible. But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love toward man appeared, not by works done in righteousness which we did ourselves, but by his mercy, according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of rebirth and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Now, Titus 3.5 is the best commentary on John 3.5. Born of water and the Spirit. So here you have it right there, and there's your reference. Without the Spirit of Christ and of God, we are none of his. Next passage we want to read and study is Romans 8. I hope you do have it and turn to it. <clears throat> in Romans 8, <clears throat> we like the first verse. There's now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. The explanation is for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus made me free from the law of sin and of death. For what that law, the law of Moses, could not do through the weakness of the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Amen. That the requirement, now ordinance is an obscure word here, the righteous deeds required by the law are to be practiced in those who walk by the spirit and not by the flesh. Amen. Amen. For the mind of the flesh leads to death, is death. But the mind of the spirit is life and peace. It's your frame of mind. What do you think? What do you want? How do you identify yourself? It was thrilling this morning to hear Ada identify herself with desires to be in the will of God. Amen. But you know lots of young people her age that do not so identify themselves. The mind of the flesh is enmity against God, hostile to God. Amen. You leave God out of this, one young woman about that age told me one time. I said, I can't do that. One of our effective preachers got to be the president of a Bible college and his wife wanted to leave him and he said, Julie, I'll quit being the president of Colegio Biblico. I'll quit being a preacher if you'll let me be your husband. She said, you'd still probably be full of that God talk, wouldn't you? And he said, yes, Julie, I probably would. When she was a classy young dame in California, she rebelled against her parents who were not religious by being very religious. She graduated from Ozark Christian College. She had two girls of teenage when she started to study in the graduate schools in South Texas somewhere, I think San Antonio, and studied counseling and psychology, which is some of the dirtiest tomarot in the world. And she fell and hook, line, and sinker for the theories of human therapy to human, uh, what is the word, uh, human, disabilities whatever they are and she just now somebody told her you rebelled against your parents when you were younger now you rebel, rebel against your husband and family it's the same spirit of personal assertion self-importance some of you know more about this and if you don't well, that's all right but it has really happened and they're close to my heart I knew them before they were married and Talked to Dean soon after it happened, and he told me more intimate details, perhaps, than the rest of you ever heard. <clears throat> and it's always been a sorrow to me.
We were reading here in Romans 8, remember, at verse 7. The mind of the flesh is hostile against God. It's not subject to the law of God, and it cannot be made to be. Amen. You cannot educate, you cannot discipline, you cannot organize, you cannot uh, impact with charismatic leadership. Amen. The mind of man, to be doing God's will, it has to be a new mind. Amen. Trade in the old one. If any man has not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Well, let's begin at the beginning of the ninth verse. Ye are not in the flesh, in the eighth verse, not seven, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Man, that's where we are, isn't it? We, they that are, are but the, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if man has not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. But if the spirit of him who raised up Christ from the dead dwells in you, what's he talking about? The spirit of God, the spirit of Christ, the spirit of him who raised up Christ, all the same thing. Amen. Now let's go back to the gospel again. John 14, 23 is an important verse to learn. In 14, 21, I read about Jesus was saying, he that has my will and loves me, he it is that, uh, uh, so on. And uh, Judas, not Iscariot, the other Judas asked, Lord, what's come to pass that you're going to visit us and and not the rest. And Jesus said this important, if any man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Amen. The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus is the same thing, Amen. at least to all practical purposes in our lives. Amen. There's God the Father, there's God the Son, who could be on earth and be obeying the Father in heaven, not pretending to obey somebody else and just obeying himself. I, I feel sorry for the Jews and others who can't see anything but a single person in God, but God says he is plural. From Genesis 1 to Revelation, he says he is plural. And one of them came and did our salvation on earth, and God was in heaven. And the third one, the Holy Spirit, uh, came down upon Jesus at his baptism and uh, is one of those that glorifies the Son, and the Son, see, God said, let us make man in our image, and we learn God is love, and God wasn't a hermit who loved himself, he's one of three who love each other, serve each other, glorify each other, and have such perfect harmony that there's just one deity, there's one wisdom, there's one righteousness, there's one perfect personal model Now, the Holy Spirit is just like Jesus, only without the body. Amen. Jesus came in the body, and somewhat limited by that. The Holy Spirit is a person just like Jesus, just like God, and you can know the Holy Spirit because you know Jesus. And we're told the Spirit of Christ is to dwell in us. In John 14, Jesus said, I will not leave you orphans, I will not leave you uh, desolate, I will come unto you, and then in the next verse, he's talking about the Spirit I will send. And so he is the spirit that was to come. John 14, 23, what does it say? If any man love me and keep my word, my father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Amen. So it's no wonder that on the day of Pentecost when Peter preached that Jesus is Lord and Christ, and men asked what to do, they were told, you Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you receive the gift of God's presence in your life, making a difference. Amen. The gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, why do we so much of the time act as if the Holy Spirit is something God deposits in a safe deposit box or somewhere, and we just know we have it because he said so? That's what we want to talk about now. The ministration of the Holy Spirit is he dwells in us. And he must displace the us, I mean our will, with his will. And we must become a new creature in him. The Holy Spirit makes all the difference. If you didn't have any difference in your life, maybe you didn't receive any gift of the Holy Spirit. God offered, but did you receive the gift? Amen. So these are some of the commandments to Christians. See category three there. Be filled with the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit. Quench not the Spirit. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. And the other passages in the next category, number four, he is a help to victorious, holy living.
By the Spirit, we put to death the deeds of the body. And that's right here in Romans 8. <clears throat> Read just a little bit more. Let's start back with the 11th verse again. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he that raised up Christ Jesus from the dead will give life also to your mortal bodies. That sounds like life from now on, no more mortal. Through his Spirit that dwells in you. So then, brethren, we are debtors. Not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if we live after the flesh, we must die. But if by the Spirit we put to death the deeds of the body, we shall live. By the Spirit put to death the deeds of the body. That's what he teaches again in Galatians 5. That walking by the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Now, some people want leading only when they're asking for some special revelation, some special solution to a special problem or something. It's every day, every hour, if your impulses and your desires and your thoughts are not being driven or molded by the Holy Spirit, then you may not have the Spirit of God. I appreciate Brother Don DeWelt very, very much, and he wrote some good works on the Holy Spirit, and especially he kept people thinking about the Holy Spirit, and so many preachers don't. But one time at Mount Vernon, Missouri, at a men's meeting, I heard Don DeWelt make a statement that I still can't figure out exactly why he would make that statement. He said, when we were baptized, we received the Holy Spirit, all of him. Oh, I can't see why he said that. Because we seem to welcome and receive the Holy Spirit bit by bit into our lives, not all of him. I doubt if any of us could contain the all of him, but that's uh, kind of speculative. God is willing to take the spirit of the cat and put it in the pig, take the spirit of his obedient son who was very uh, trusting and cooperative and understanding and with full desire obeyed the Father. He wants to put that spirit into me and into you. Amen. Thank God. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. You talk about going to have a study on the Holy Spirit, same thing, you're going to study tongues and healing and uh, slain in the Spirit, falling dead on the floor, and uh, whether you should uh, sing in a certain style or preach in a certain style and things like that. None of those have anything to do much with the subject. The subject of the Holy Spirit is the rule of Christ in your mind, in your feelings, in your desires, and the changing of human nature is the changing of desires. Amen. Now let's got to look at 2 Peter 1, 3, and 4. His divine power hath granted unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and virtue, or you can translate it to his own glory and virtue. It works both ways, but... You can't tell exactly from the form of the Greek which he had in mind. Whereby also he granted to us his precious and exceeding great promises that through these, the promises, you may be become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in this world through desires, the desires of human nature, the foolish and fickle and conflicting desires of human nature. What is human nature? It's a set of desires often contradictory and inconsistent, and that's what makes our human nature to have so much conflict within ourselves and between us. But you, you treasure the promise of God and really believe him, then you receive. Now take your next sheet to uh, the uh, how and when do we receive the Holy Spirit. You can talk about this. I was lecturing out a church at Monette on the Holy Spirit. And, a good man, leader of the church. <clears throat> but how and when do we receive the Holy Spirit? You see that title? One of the six sides you're looking at there. Well, there are various conflicting answers offered by people who judge this by their own reasoning or their own experience. And a lot of people think, well, Acts 2.38 and 39 just settles that. That doesn't say that's the first time or the only time that anybody can have the Holy Spirit. If you repent and are baptized into Christ for remission of sins, you who were like the people at Jerusalem convinced of the Messiahship of Jesus at that moment, um, this will be one of the results. 
But when we don't know enough about the subject and we draw a hasty conclusion that the Holy Spirit always comes fully to everybody who's baptized or that nobody without baptism could ever have any working of the Holy Spirit in their lives, we try to back up and regroup. Amen. All right, look at 1 Corinthians 12.3. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 12, 3, the Apostle Paul is starting to explain about gifts of the Spirit, or what he calls the spirituals. And he says, I want you to know that the Holy Spirit is one, and that no one can say that Jesus is cursed by the Holy Spirit. You can't do that by the Holy Spirit. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And that is when we begin to hear the story of Jesus, we're convinced that Jesus is Lord. We're convinced enough that we're opening our minds to the, our minds and our hearts. I was trying to say minds and hearts at the same time. Um, to the word of God, which conveys his personality to us. Already we're being influenced by the Holy Spirit when we can say Jesus is Lord. Amen. And so this is very similar to the 13th verse, same chapter. From 3 down to 13, he says, in the same language in Greek, by the Holy Spirit, or in the, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, we're all baptized into one body, and we're made to be partakers of, or made to drink of, the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Being made to drink of the Holy Spirit comes there along with the baptism, too. And when John asked 12, I mean, Paul asked 12 men at Ephesus, did you receive the Holy Spirit having believed, in the way the Greek puts it, puts in an aorist participle? The King James said, after that you believe. That's misleading. But when you believed is more likely translation. But having believed, did you receive the Holy Spirit? They said, we never heard about the Holy Spirit. We didn't hear the Holy Spirit was given. And this caused Paul to question their baptism. See? How can anybody be brought to obedience of faith in Christ unto remission of sins and not be brought to open his heart to the Spirit of God. Because it's by faith, as he said in Ephesians what 3.17, that the Spirit may dwell in you through faith. Well, here we're looking at these passages. I'm going to take each one of them, but uh, <clears throat> in Acts 5.32 we are witnesses, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God gives to them that obey him. And here, that's a strange, and, I, and we talked about Luke eleven thirteen, God gives the Holy Spirit to them that ask him. And John fourteen twenty three, love him and keep his word. I liked what Don DeWelt said about if you want to know the Holy Spirit and walk by the Spirit, you memorize everything Jesus said and just keep that in mind and follow it all your life, and it will automatically work. You just be filled with the words of God, Colossians 3, 16, 17. Let the word of God dwell in you richly. And in all wisdom, teach and admonish one another. And with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, sing with gratitude in your hearts unto God. And whatever you do in word or in deed, do it as an agent of the Lord Jesus Christ doing his business. That's in the name of. Signing checks in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and other business in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I call you, I tell you, that's a fourfold formula for a full and fruitful life of faith. <laughs> you can be sure of a good success in the Christian life if you follow that recipe. Really, there's a fifth one, thanks. Before it came, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts and be thankful, be filled with the, let the word dwell in you richly, and uh, the second one was in wisdom, teach and admonish one another, what we're trying to do here. And third, sing with gratitude in your hearts to God. And fourth, uh, well, you, um, whatever you do, in word or in deed, on the telephone or on vacation or on the job, or when you just hit the wrong nail with a hammer, whatever deed you do, whatever word you speak, represent Jesus Christ. And when you're in the church and you have a complaint and you get a, an argument going, talk about what Jesus wants, not what I want. Amen. Amen. <laughs> it's a practical thing. The Holy Spirit is the presence of Jesus 
overruling my thoughts with his thoughts, giving me the impulse of feelings I never naturally had, and he should have charge of our wills. What is a spirit? A mind or thinking processes, uh, feelings, likes and dislikes, which I think people ought to have less of, <laughs> their own likes and dislikes, and uh, decision and will and a sense of moral responsibility, conscience. This makes a personality and a spirit. And you can't have your own spirit and the spirit of Christ in conflict with each other living in your life. You're going to have to surrender yours to his. Love is surrender to his will. Believe him and take his word for it, whether you can see the reason why or not. Amen. So those are the passages that I got out for Joe Holland when he asked that question. I couldn't answer the question. The Lord knows. And he gave us these. Now, take this down to the bottom. Here is the summary of the matter. The mind of Christ is to be in us is the gift from God to all who will change the center of their affections from self to Christ enough to seek to abide in him. The Lord promises to come and abide in them. Mm -hmm. To those who repent and obey, he promises the gift of the Holy Spirit. All who have believed his word and surrendered to him have been born anew of water and the Spirit. In these, the Holy Spirit dwells. See these passages we've just gone over. They're led by the Spirit to live not after the flesh, but to crucify the flesh and to bear the fruit of the Spirit. If they will permit it by yielding themselves, God works in them a mighty, with a mighty power. To keep them from shutting Christ out, they are urged continually to keep putting off the old man and building up the new man. Amen. If so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off. Now we have to make some decisions for ourselves in doing this. You put off the old man concerning your former manner of life, which is corrupt according to the deceit, the lusts of deceit. I don't like the translation that's here, or the modern translation, the international version. The, I, I believe the Greek really says, we were corrupt according to the desires of deceit. And we live by deceiving ourselves and being deceived. You put on the new man, which after God is created in the righteousness of truth and holiness of truth. Righteousness and holiness come with the truth. Now, he's not describing true holiness as compared to some of the kind of holiness. The Apostle Paul knew the Greek adjective, aletheinos, genuine or true. But when he talks about the righteousness and holiness of truth, that covers a great deal more territory and has more moral suasion than true holiness or true righteousness. Actually, there's no other kind of righteousness that counts but God's righteousness or other kind of holiness that counts but God's holiness. And we're not distinguishing true from, uh, from phony. We're talking about truth is the vehicle of righteousness and holiness. Amen. Be filled with the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit. Let the mind of Christ be in them. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Now take a look at the other sheet quickly. I'll oh, just win this... Uh, has to quit, but there's a lot in the New Testament. I want to give you these sheets so you go home and don't try to remember my judgment, but you try to read these passages and see just what they say to you. And especially a lot of those who do not use the word spirit, but are talking about Christ in your life. So see this, the mind of Christ in us. What in plain words is the mind of Christ? It's many things. It's the thoughts of Christ occupying our consciousness and molding our our stream of consciousness and our kinds of decisions and conclusions. It's the unselfishness of Christ overruling our selfishness to get to the heart of the matter. He was completely obedient toward God and devoted to the service of man, seeking not his own will at all. As long as we seek to have our own way in the smallest details of life, we need to change and yield to the mind of Christ. Amen. You have no right to comb your hair like that, Leon. 
just because you want to. You know that. Now, we have a lot of liberty in this matter. We worked together in the faculty of the Ozark Christian College for many years with a harmony that a lot of people wondered at. How do you do that? Lynn Gardner figured out we have a togetherness and purpose, a sense of freedom of individuality, and a sense of grace about what judgment we used, but that common purpose to Christ. As dean for 39 years, I was never afraid of the faculty because they were men who had the spirit of Christ. If Christ ruled over them, I didn't have to. And anybody who tries to run a Christian institution or a local church and thinks they have to rule over the congregation is a fool. Amen. He doesn't understand the problem. All our attempts to control one another confess our failure to convert men to Christ, to be believers in Christ and filled Amen. with the Spirit of Christ. Amen. And even if they disagreed with me, I knew these men wanted to serve Christ and in the, sought the holiness and righteousness of truth. And they were not hard to get along with, any of them, through all those, the whole generation in which we had several different men. Now, Wally, not about the way it was? <laughs> it just, you know, I, I think that if we would seek to develop the devotion to Christ and the humility of learning from Christ and the practice of submitting ourselves to one another in reverence for Christ, Ephesians 5.21, very important, and Galatians 5.13, be slaves one another in love. For freedom did Christ set you free, but do not use that freedom as an occasion to selfish indulgence, but through love be servants, slaves to one another. Amen. So then Galatians 5, an important part of this study. Romans 8 and Galatians 5 probably most of all. Let's pray with Paul the prayer for each other that he prayed Ephesians 3. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father. And he, the next verse kind of causes misunderstanding. From whom every family on earth, I think it meant all fatherhood in heaven on earth, gets its name and prototype. He's talking about who God is when we call him Father all the best of fatherhood is just learned from God. And he used a word that's a common word for family, but he uses it about all fatherhood. Now this is the prayer, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory. That you may be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inward man. Don't we need that power? That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Mm -hmm. That's praying for the Holy Spirit. To the end that you being rooted and grounded in love may become strong to apprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth. That you may know the love of Christ which surpasses all knowledge. Mm -hmm. Amen. That you may be filled unto all the fullness of God. Amen. And having prayed such a monstrous prayer with such a wide scope. And so it's a deep content. He then said, now unto him who is able to do something about that. Amen. Able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Unto him be glory in Christ. Uh, 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 do it through his spirit that dwells in us. That's the, Amen. According to the power that works in us. The end of the 20th verse. According to the power that works in us. Unto him be glory in the church. And so many people don't see the glory of God in the church. They see the foibles and faults of men in the church. The prayer needs to be that you all be strengthened with power through his presence in your hearts. Christ dwelling in you through faith. Knowing that surpassing love that you may be filled unto all the fullness of God. What God is, we want to be, not to rule things, but to be like him. That's the song we're going to sing, Oh, to be like him. I guess the rest of these notes I'll have to come back and give you another time. You, you study these passages. They've got it. There's so many ways to put it I'd like to, to mention to you. <clears throat> you can remember the, the pig and the cat. You just consider your life as a business you've been running, and you get into trouble within and without, 
And Jesus comes along and he buys it over and takes it over and opens it up under new management and then lets you claim all the profit and the, and the pleasure of doing that business. You just take your life and open it up under new management and never claim to be the owner of it. Just rejoice to be the successful proprietor for the Lord Jesus. Amen.